following along in the Pew Bible, that would be page 809. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called to them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So once again, I hope you have your Bible open to Matthew chapter 4, where John read for us today. And you're like, what does this have to do with Christmas? But did you know that Jesus is the redeemer of our past? And we see in this story of the Christmas carol, a non-inspired story that Scrooge is transported back to the past to remember who he once was. Some of those memories are good, and others are painful. But acknowledging and remembering past uh, events, uh, that puts him on a path of redemption, ultimately. So take a look at this scene from uh, The Christmas Carol, or Christmas Carol, where Scrooge is coming to grips with some of his past. You remember this place? Fezziwig's Warehouse. I was apprenticed here. It's old Fezziwig. It's old Fezziwig alive again. Ebenezer! Dick! Yes, sir? Ebenezer Scrooge? Dick Wilkins? Yes, sir. Do you observe the time, sir? Five minutes past seven, sir. Do you know you've let me work you five minutes overtime? <laughs> no more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick, Christmas Ebenezer. Up with the shutters, close up shop. <laughs> Billy Eye, Dick, Jerry Ebenezer. What a lark. He always comes through, doesn't he? Always comes through his old Fezziwig. And Royally, too. And Royally, too. Nothing's too good for Fezziwig. Close up tight, sir. Tight as a barrel, sir. Good. Now about tomorrow. <coughs> it's a holiday, of course, but I shall expect you to spend part of it at least with me. Eating Christmas dinner. <laughs> ah, thank, thank you, you sir. sir. And it's probably a week too much to be any good next day. We'll make that holiday, too. <laughs> good night, Ebenezer. Good night. 
Dick. Good night, sir. And thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Solid Joe in his own fizzle league. Solid gold through and through. What is the matter? Nothing in particular. Something, I think. Yes, there is. Old Fezziwig was very kind to me. Yes, he was. But he's dead now. Perhaps you feel you'd like to repay his kindness to you. Well? You have a clock, Bob Cratchit. Old Fezziwig would have been very happy if you had shown your gratitude to him by showing kindness to others. Your clock, for instance. Business is business. I am a good businessman. My time grows short. I've yet to show you the black years of your life. Your gradual enslavement to greed. Your ruthlessness. No, no. Your ingratitude. Your wretched thirst for gold. No, no, leave me. I can't stand more. I can't stand more. Ever wanted to go back in time and I want I wanted to go back in time and just slap me. Um, there's you know, who's this old guy that just showed up and slapped me? You know, it's, like, it's you. you know. But um, isn't God good? When you think about it, He knows our past. He knows our faults, and He invites us to join Him anyway. So let's take some time to look at a time when he called his first disciples and uh, he asked them to drop their nets and follow him. So we saw that passage of scripture that John read to us this morning. Let's pray as we continue on here. Father, we flat out need you. If all of us had a video took the time and each of us had a video of our past and decisions that we made there are certain times where we won't mind that plan but then there are other times we just shake our head we, it may even be it may even be this past week it may even been this morning and uh, we're ashamed and yet you're you reach into our lives and you call us out of that. For each of us that has been called out, I'd ask you, Lord, that there'd be a part of us that would remember where we came from. There's a, I know the Bible says forgetting those things which are behind, but I think you were focusing on the thing of what I'd accomplished, my trophies, my, my greatness. I press on. But every now and then, you've called us to remember. That humbles us. And you call us even to remember your goodness to us. You talk about raising a, an Ebenezer. It's ironic. Raising a monument of your goodness to us. And so, Father, we this morning acknowledge that we're grateful for what you have done and what you continue to do and how you hear us in spite of us based on the work of your son. I ask you, God, that as we're looking at this story today, that even though there's a temptation to be nostalgic alone at Christmas time, that we would have an understanding. You're in the business of changing people's lives we would just be able to stop and, and reflect on that. So thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to keep your finger there in the book of Matthew, but I'd like you to do this if you can. Some of you may not have that kind of Bible. Maybe you could look on an app on your phone or whatever. But to go back into a Land of Israel uh, map, so in the back of some of your Bibles you have a map, and I'd like you to just take a look at that for a moment of the time of Jesus's ministry on the earth. So look back at a map right now. 
And if I see you looking up at me, that means you're not doing what I said, and we'll have to have you write a thousand times on the blackboard, I didn't turn in my Bible when I should have. Yeah. You're so fearful, I see you moving. Yeah. But there's something about going to a map and taking a look at this place that these things really happened. I don't know if you have opportunity. Every now and then when I get to do this, I like to go back home to where I grew up in Chicago and go back to my old neighborhood. By the way, I just found out like in the last year they tore down the house that I grew up in. That was, huh? You know, so I can't, I'll go back to the lot or to the new house that they built. But I'd like you to take a look at this area over here, which is the what is called the Sea of Galilee, okay? So this is that place that Jesus called his disciples from, the Sea of Galilee. And I want you to have an understanding because you and I are sitting here and going, well, I don't, I don't feel like that big of a deal. Good, you're in good company. Did you know the, the one guy that was the most successful the one guy that if we would look at, he's got letters behind his name, and he's Mr. Got Life Figured Out, got a degree, was Judas. The rest were blue-collar, hard-working guys that God got a hold of their lives and changed them, so much so that when people would come in contact with them, they go, wow, that." They knew that they had the words, I love how God puts it, that they had, these are uneducated, unlearned men who had been with Jesus, is what it says. And so you want to have an impact on your world? Spend time with Jesus. That's what's going to make the difference. And so if you can imagine, that's the kind of people that he calls. And we see that in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians where he says, not many are called, brothers, that are a big deal, but he chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And so if you're sitting here today, even if you've got some education in your background and things like that, you know what you really are like. And you may be sitting here, but I, and I, I don't know how God could use me with even what was going on last night. Well, this is the God we're dealing with here. And so we come to this Sea of Galilee, and I want you to know that, that the Jews were, I want to give you a little geographical um, lesson. The Jews were fond of calling lakes by the term seas, but if you ever get a chance to go over there, they're not very, it's not very big. The Sea of Galilee isn't very big. Any body of water was given that name, even inland sea, called the Dead Sea. They called the Dead Sea, and the Jordan River connects from the upper Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. But the Sea of Galilee is a lake. It's below sea level. It's about 12 to 13 miles long and about 9 miles wide. And it's called Galilee because that's the district. That's, that's, and as you get to know an area, it's funny how different parts, and I don't even want to start here in our church, and just talking in Warren County, oh, you're from... But we all have these views of things. But you do understand that when Jesus called people out, he called people from Arkansas, West Virginia, Kentucky. He called people that you and I would not at first grab our attention because that's not, God doesn't, need a big deal person to do his work because then they could ultimately get the glory i've heard that i don't know how many times boy if this person got saved oh if only this person got saved boy and i'm thinking no actually they'd just be going all praise that person but we have this group of people here that are from galilee and you remember that this this area they were known to be galileans and they would say it with that they would say they're from the area of, he's from where, he's from Nazareth? Don't you, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. 
And I love that. Any state of the union, God could call somebody. Isn't that good? Isn't that good to know? Now, we typically know it as the Sea of Galilee, but it goes by other names. It's called the Lake of Gennesaret. If you know that, it's, it's called that in the Gospel of Luke. Gennesaret because this is the flat agricultural plain on the northwestern shore named after the city of Gennesaret and the plain of Gennesaret. It's connected with the city where the fields are located. And so this lake, which fed that area, was also called the Lake of Gennesaret. Now, if you're reading the Old Testament, and you might even see this on the map that you have there, you won't find the Lake of Gennesaret, you won't find the Sea of Galilee. You'll find when the land was apportioned out of the Old Testament under Joshua, and we've worked through that in our ser series on Joshua, it's called the Lake of Kinneret. And that's the, that's the present Jewish name in Israel today, the Kinneret Lake. Why is it called Kinneret? It comes from the word Kinnor, and Kinnor is a harp. So take a look at the Sea of Galilee again with me. You see the shape? And so you notice how these things take on different names. And if you were living in that area, you'd know that. Well, you and I would be, oh, yeah, that's obvious. And it's interesting, as I spend more, I've been here 18 years, and I'm still learning things just about Warrington and Warren County. Because there's people that you'll sit next to them, and they, got, they know all these things. They know all these places. They talk about the bottoms here. I didn't know what the bottoms were until I got here. I thought that was like, Something else. You know. All right. But this is, this is the thing. It's even, this even is called the Sea of Tiberias, named after one of the Roman leaders. But this is Jesus. He's moving through this area here. And so point number one as we're working through this together, point number one, watch the Christ watch the Christ. And I want to encourage you at this Christmas time that you would allow that to be your prayer. God, I want to see you. I want to see your son. I don't want to get I don't want to get caught up in all the stuff that's so easy to get caught up in. Watch the Christ. Look at it again with me at verse 18. I love this. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, isn't this just so regular of life? While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. So, matter of fact, he's going by their place of employment. And Jesus goes by these brothers. And the kind of net they're using is called, and I want to say it right, an amphibolstrong. This is a circular, bell-shaped draw net which was thrown in such a way that it spread out over the surface of the water and trapped everything beneath it as it sank. So get the idea what's going on with Jesus. He's walking. These guys are working. By the way, they had had contact with him before. The Gospel of John tells us. And remember, the Gospels all have different vantage points. We've talked about that before of taking this picture. And so John, which is not a synoptic gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptics. And what that is, there, there's, a, there's this uh, synonymous way that those three are writing. But John, it's almost like he's got this perspective from on high. Remember how he starts it? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with it. And so he's got that, that, that viewpoint. And so John tells us earlier, oh yeah, the, the disciples, before they became disciples, they were watching Jesus. They were spending time. It wasn't like he just showed up walking by this beach at this point. He says that, and then it, he doesn't know them from Adam, and then they drop their nets and take their... No, he, they've been watching him. They've, been, they've had some, somewhat of some sort of relationship with him, and we'll see in a moment even how it could have been even closer. But he's getting into their lives, and this for us is so important. And I want to encourage you, and I beat this drum last week, but I'm going to mention it again. 
Some of you have been in the lives of people for a very long time, and they know you're good, and they know you go to church, and they know, and they like you, but they've never heard the gospel from you. They just know you mow your lawn, you, you, and I could start listing all these things that are good things. It's great that it happens, but have they? Would they know that person? That person shared Christ with me. And I love how Jesus is modeling this for us. He's walking and he's in their lives. He's going past, past their place of employment and he's, he's taking an interest. And you'll see in a moment he's using even their lingo to get his point across. He's not speaking Christianese. He loves them so much and I know you're like, but that's Jesus. He's God. Like, he's really smart. You know? But he's given us the capability. If we love, I watch you with your grandkids, friends. I watch you with your kids, how you talk. It's just, it's love. You're, those of you with your friends, it's just love. And so this is Jesus. He's doing it. So I'm watching Jesus, and, and I want to encourage you, even after today, in church, we're having a Sunday school lesson on evangelism. We're going to be talking about taking advantage of an opportunity to share Christ, and I want to invite you to that, what that could look like. It's free, by the way, free. Point number two, watch the challenge. Watch the challenge. Look at verse 19 with me. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And we've heard the song. I mean, we've sung the song. BBS, Sunday school, whatever it's been. He doesn't rebuke Peter and Andrew for returning so readily to their regular business. You know, you, you, you've heard me before. You've, you've seen me. You think by now you would have been all in, but they're just going back to their job. He hasn't called them yet, but like, all right, we've had opportunities to talk. We've had... You've seen me. What's taking you so long? No, he's just calling them to ministry. And I like this. It's far better than them being idle. Once again, a push for work, an encouragement. Working's not a bad thing. The time had come, however, for them to make a lifetime commitment to the master. And so he challenges them using their occupation as an illustration of the kind of work in which from then on they were going to be engaged. I'm calling you to something deeper. I'm calling you to become fishers of men. Your business is moving from the temporary to the eternal. And by, here's the beauty of it. We can do it with whatever job we got. He just picked this one. Point number three, watch the choice. Watch the choice. Verse 20, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Does that, does that look like that for you when Christ called you? It's like, this is a no-brainer. I'm all in. I know some of us, it, it took a while but they needed no further persuasion. They'd already seen enough of Jesus to be convinced that he's, this, he's, the, he's the Messiah. Not completely. They don't understand all that's involved, but enough to do what they did, drop in the nest. We're doing this. It's a chance of a lifetime to be called to be this charter member of this, this kingdom. They don't even know what they're getting into, but I'm in. And at that time, they had no idea where he was heading and he's not heading toward a throne he's heading toward a tomb they did not know that what lays ahead of him was a cross and not a crown that stuff comes later and some of us we 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 gave our lives to christ and it would be nice if there was all of that but there's going to be some rough sledding there's going to be some hard times and so right now, I don't know what this time looks like for you right now. I don't know. But maybe right now, you're like, I'm getting more 
tomb than um, throne and get more cross than crown and just know he hears you he hears you isn't there a beauty to bear with this word ignorance there's a beauty to it did a wedding on Friday and you're like what in the world ignorance and you're talking about weddings what's the deal but there's a beauty to not knowing everything in our future and how hard things can be because let's face it would we do some of the things that we do getting married having kids taking some of the steps we do if somebody tell, hey I just want to tell you this is what it's all going to look like and we got this idea about this and by the way Amen. I'm all about marriage, okay? So in case you're sitting there, boy, thanks for the downer, all right? (laughs) But honestly, we could not handle it, and God knows that. We we could not handle it. And so he's, in his graciousness, goes, yeah, I'll just keep you ignorant. Like, honestly, every couple, I do premarital counseling, and I start talking about, like, some of the real things about arguments and things like that, and they look at me like it's Chinese. What? If they were from China, they'd completely understand it. But you know, you know, you know, I'm saying it's it's another language. Oh boy! But so so they're looking at me. But there's a beauty to it. There's I just look at them and go like, oh, you don't know, you don't know. This is awesome. But you know what? It's cool. It's great. And God even does that with us with the calling. You don't, we don't know. We don't know all we're getting into. But we can trust him. He's good. Yeah, amen. And just seeing that couple, that, that couple, they want, they want to serve the Lord. They want to walk with God. What better way to start? And God will get them through the, the stuff. Because he's a good God. That's my prayer to each and every one of us right now. Whatever you're in the midst of if it's heading away from God stop walk with God it's the it's so much the better way and so they don't know all that's in front of them but they drop their nets and they move point number four watch the call Watch the call. Verse 21. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. So farther down the lake were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Zebedee, it seems, was this prosperous fisherman with a number of men on his payroll. Look at this in Mark 1 verse 20 and immediately called them and they left their father's evidence in the boat with the hired servants and followed him so to give you an idea that there's more involved living in this and from the fact that John seems to have known Annas the high priest see this in John 18 15 Simon Peter followed Jesus remember this is around the crucifixion and so did another disciple and that is by the way code you know this, those of you that have done Bible study for years, code in the book of John for himself is another disciple. Or he had other names, but he doesn't name himself. Since that disciple, this other disciple, was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. So he has some clout because he knows the high priest. And so it seems that we can infer that maybe Zebedee's family was somewhat well-to-do. And here's the only place in Scripture we meet Zebedee in person. He raised no objection. Look at that context there. He raises no objections to his sons leaving the family business. Think about how we would handle that. If we've got dreams, we've got plans. They walk right off the job. Never to come back to it. And they're following, they're fishermen, listen, they're following a carpenter from Nazareth. 
sometimes we watch our kids and we go, what are they doing? And I want to trust the Lord with my kids' lives. This carpenter claims to be Israel's Messiah. This says something about Zebedee. What a noble person he's trusting. We meet his wife, Salome, several times. She once asked Jesus to give her two sons honored places in his kingdom. We talked about that leading up to that last week. Look at this in Matthew 20 and 21. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. This is Jesus she's talking to. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom, James and John. And so if that's the case, Salome and Zebedee were the Lord's aunt and uncle and James and John. I'm sorry, so let me move up here. She was present at the crucifixion, Mark 15, 40. There were among, also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the son, mother of James the younger and Joseph and Salome. And then she was one of the women who went to the sepulcher. Mark 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And so some think that Salome and the Lord's mother were sisters, John 19, verse 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And so if that's the case, Salome and Zebedee, were the Lord's aunt and uncle, and James and John were his cousins. And that might help explain why Zebedee was so willing to let his two boys go. And he would have known, because he's a family member, he probably would have known some of the miraculous circumstances around the Christmas story, around the birth of Christ. I mean, there's claims coming up. Why is she pregnant? All the things that we hear about as we work through this story. Zebedee, these aren't stupid people. These are successful people. They're watching. And so like Andrew and Peter, James and John waste no time. We see, look at that in verse 21, 22. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. It's significant that Simon and Andrew were casting their nets when they were called, and James and John were mending them. And this is just a picture here. Andrew and Peter became great soul winners, and James and John, especially John, were more pastor, teacher, discipler types. And James was ultimately martyred early in the history of the church. But here's my point to you this morning. I don't know what your past looked like, but did you know that Simon had his name changed by Jesus. He said, I, you're called Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter because on this rock I'm going to build the church. Petros, petroleum, rock, rocky. It's a pretty cool nickname. In fact, when, when Simon Peter starts getting carnal, you know what Jesus says to him? Simon, Simon goes back to his old name. I wonder what my heavenly name is. And there's times where he goes, Mark, Mark, Mark. He's got something like amazing human being. I don't know what the name is. Okay? <laughs> why do you, I wonder why you laugh. No. Um, but I, I, I wonder if there's, I'm calling you to be different. Remember James and John, what their nick nickname was for Jesus? Remember that nickname? The Sons of Thunder. You're like, you know, WWE, you know. Like, the Sons of Thunder. Do you remember why he named them that? Remember, he's, they were upset about some Samaritans. And he goes, hey, can we, because they had seen Jesus do some powerful things. So like, can we call down, like, lightning on these guys and just, like, zap them? Nuke them. Let's take care of this. And Jesus, <laughs> it's Jesus. By the way, Jesus could do that at any time. And he didn't. That's, that's wow. Here's my point. Jesus changes our name. Jesus changes us. And so he can take 
big mouth, people that just say the dumbest stuff sometimes and use them for his glory. And so if you're the person, and I've been there, my, words are my currency, and because I do a lot of speaking and a lot of talking, it's got me into trouble. And there's times, literally, I remember early on, I'd get quiet in certain places, and here's why I got quiet. I was sick of messing up. You know? And then the same people, some of the same people that would complain later, hey, man, why aren't you talking? Because every time I do, but I know, here's what I want to say to you. God wants to use you with your talking ability. Sons of Thunder, go on and call out. I think they got some anger issues. And some of you are sitting here and go, God can never use me. I got anger issues. Allow him to work on that, but he can use you. And, and with that kind of, the, you'd start to get angry about what really matters. Because there's a calling of God in our lives sometimes to be angry but sin not. And whatever the thing is, whatever the thing is in your life that you're like, oh, I'm going to always be this way, that God would take it and turn it. And you'd be a trophy of grace for him. So he takes your past and he calls you. I'm calling you because I want to use you for my kingdom, for what is eternal. So I'm asking you today, what's the thing holding you back from accepting that redemptive work? Scrooge, looking back, it's painful. But in order to grow in grace, let's offer our past to Jesus. I'm going to give God my past. From Chicago. I think I could use anything good come out of Chicago. Al Capone, you know, could name names, but it's a mess. I'm ashamed of it right now, to be honest with you. But that's my, that's my hometown, that's my story, and I want to be used of God. I'd like you to take again a look at the map, and, and instead of the New Testament time map, I would like you to look back on the map, maybe like the kingdom of of Israel when David was in charge or the time as they're settling in Israel with Joshua and he's allotting the land. But I want you to take a look at what's around the Sea of Galilee for a moment. What's around the Sea of Galilee? And sometimes it names the tribes that are around the, the area there. And so what I have here, if you look, we got Zebulun on this side of the Sea of Galilee you got Issachar down here. What do you got over here? It's a tribe called Naphtali. Huh. Naphtali. You remember a lot of people coming out of Naphtali? I mean, we know David comes out of Judah. We know that um, Joshua is Ephraim. I could start naming. But Naphtali, what's the... Well, if I, I would like you for a moment to look at a time when Jacob is blessing the sons of um, his sons, basically. Sons of Israel. He's going to die. And look what he says to Naphtali. Naphtali is a doe let loose that bears beautiful fawns. And that's all it says about Naphtali. And you'll, you'll read that same section of scripture and it talks about Judah, and it compares it to what? You remember Judah gets compared to a lot? A lion. Oh, I like that lion. Naphtali is a doe. You, you look at that, it's doe. What, well, did you know in the scripture, when he, taught, when he uses uh, the heart, you ever hear of the H-A-R-T, the heart? Or as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs... Those of you, I watch the stuff going on on social media with those of you that are hunters and your kids, and you got these pictures of that, that deer, just, you know. And I'm just like, you know, the other day, I think Justice Davis, nine years old, got a deer. And he's able to provide that for the home, you know. And I, I'm going at nine, I'm like, I can jump fences and do really good at hide and seek, you know. But I bring nothing to the table. Nothing. Maybe a plate that my mom ordered me to bring, okay? 
but he can bring, he brought the meat. He's nine! And the picture there of dough and this, this idea of, of that power, hind's feet, the Bible talks about, that's steady. And so we see a Naphtali is a doe let loose that bears beautiful fawns. And as you read the scriptures, you go, I don't see any Naphtali, what's this happening? But we see it in this story that we just got done reading. Because you look at the area. It's around Galilee. And so this steady area that goes through the whole New Te- Old Testament that you don't hear much about, but now it's coming to fruition. And out of it is going to become some of, the, some of the greatest preachers are going to come out that they're going to do battle. They're going to be able to stand on hind's feet and they're going to run and, and share the truth. And then from them, others are born. And so as, other, as people would go, ah, has anything good come out of that area? They're Galileans. They can go, I'm from Naphtali. And in my soul like the deer pants after the waters of God and then I want to be used of him to feed others he fulfills that prophecy isn't God good he doesn't forget his promises and he hasn't forgot them in your life or mine he says this for you and me he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it he can be trusted and you're going I don't he isn't hearing me he's not doing well he may not do what you want to do He's working. Would you trust him today? Let's pray.